Nearly 800, uh, three quarters of a million Americans have strokes each year. Uh, strokes, unlike, uh, well, strokes often don't kill patients. Patients often live with strokes for decades. There are, at this point, over 7 million Americans living daily with the effects of a debilitating stroke. <clears throat> this is the, I'm going to give you the story of Sonia Kuntz. At age 31, and we won't get into why this happened, but at age 31, she had a stroke. She couldn't uh, use, she lost the use of her right uh, arm, her right leg, and she couldn't communicate. Her first reaction when it happened was, um, or she had significant problems communicating. She was able to uh, train out of some of those problems, but continue to have significant communication problems. This is her, uh, at that time, fiancé, now husband, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Kuntz. Her first reaction when she had the stroke was to call Peter, but she said, I couldn't even say the name Peter. That's how, uh, that's what her communication problems were. Now, um, she went on to develop significant depression. Uh, stroke victims often develop uh, debilitating fatigue. And again, this is not, oh, I'm tired. This is a type of fatigue that does not leave. It's beyond uh, the, um, the fatigue that, most, uh, that uh, most of us go through, even temporarily. And again, it's 24-7. Um, it's probably, it, um, uh, I've done some research on it. it, it it's uh, probably associated with the injury to the brain. Uh, she developed some severe uh, depression. Again, the depression associated with, um, with uh, strokes is uh, very debilitating and, again, also uh, suspected to be related to the significant injury, uh, physical injury, going on in the brain itself. As you see, um, Sonia's comment was, I felt I was trapped inside my body. Um, now, this one, this one had a... Um, this sounds, most strokes are really bad, permanent stories. This one was not. Um, we'll talk about why it, why it ended up with a, a good ending and why it wasn't a permanent stroke. Um, but first, a brief introduction. My name is Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R. -E -E I started off as an ER doc. Um, patients bring uh, death, disease, and disability into the ER that really should have been prevented. Uh, I developed a passion for that. There weren't many places to train in prevention. Uh, Hopkins was one of them. I went there, uh, loved it, had a blast, uh, did well, ended up running the program, and uh, have been working with uh, docs, mostly primary care docs, but uh, cardiologists, other specialists as well, and patients in terms of uh, helping move prevention ahead. It's so much better to prevent than it is to try to, um, to do treatment after the fact. Now, again, this, uh, this video is about doing treatment after the fact on a stroke. Um, if you want to, <clears throat> there's a whole lot of videos on this channel about how to prevent stroke in the first place. There are a couple of reasons I'm, um, I'm including this uh, video on the channel. One is the, we, we focus a lot on science, uh, a, one of the new developments in science right now is stem cell. And stem cell was involved in this. Um, <clears throat> in fact, she went, she lived uh, close enough. She went to Stanford. This is Dr. Gary Steinberg. He's the head of neurosurgery at Stanford. And he was doing a, uh, a very small study looking at the potential for stem cells with stroke patients. And this is that story. In 2013, adult stem cells were surgically injected into Sonia's brain near the damaged area. Now, <clears throat> let me focus for a second on the uh, term adult stem cells. These were not, uh, those, th there's been a huge amount of focus, concern, uh, ethics issues around stem cells. And in the beginning, um, there was experimentation with um, embryonic stem cells, things like that.
that's I'm sure it's still happening somewhere and sometimes, but that's rare. The vast majority of stem cell work uh, at this point um, involves adult stem cells. Uh, there, there are some stem cell activities in, involving uh, cord blood and uh, placental tissue, but again, uh, no damage to any uh, any fetuses, embryos. In fact, in in many of these. Uh, no young human tissue is involved at all. I did a, um, a video, I think it will publish October 24th, on why that's the case. And back in 2007, there were some Japanese researchers who were able to take adult skin tissue, cells, from, normal uh, skin cells, they were fibroblasts, uh, connective tissue cells. These researchers were able to induce stem cell function. Now you may ask what's a stem cell? It's a cell that can replicate over and over and over again. Not only did they induce stem cell function, what they were able to do is induce what we call pluripotent stem cell function. Pluripotent means um, it's a cell that can go to any type of tissue. It could go to brain tissue, heart tissue, lung tissue, kidney tissue, skin tissue. Um, Again, as we get into that discussion, we start getting a lot deeper into the technology of stem cell activities. Uh, we're not going to do that on this video. We're just going to tell a story. Um, <clears throat> there are. We're also not going to get into some of the the public reaction to this story and similar stories that came out. This is one of the major ones creating uh, the public reaction. As you remember, there are over 7 million people with per permanent um, paralysis and significant disability associated with stroke alone. When they heard this story, everybody wanted to see if they could get stem cells. And with that kind of uh, demand out there, there are tons of people who are providing stem cells. Uh, a whole lot of them are... Uh, there are huge problems in terms of research. I talk about those in some other videos as well. But let's get back to Sonia Kuntz's story. They put her in a halo because they had to get sub-millimeter uh, focus on the areas where they were going to inject these stem cells. This is the, a picture of the OR when they were doing the, uh, the stereoscopic uh, location. It's like using a GPS except within the brain and that halo was critical for that GPS function. Here is Sonia immediately after surgery. And this raises a question for me. You would think that uh, if it was stem cells, they would have to have time to grow back in uh, to provide that... Um, that motion. This happened immediately after surgery. This was Sonia trying to raise her right arm before surgery. Immediately after surgery, before surgery. The communication problems, the ability to walk, all were hugely impacted and in a positive way. In 2016, her son uh, Lucien was born and um, at this point, she and Peter are happily raising Lucian. So thank you for your interest.